God they hooked up with Cross to get a couple of decent shoes. Yeah. But one of the shoes they offer, if you haven't seen it, I've spoken about it before, I think I've showed a picture. They have work boots with zigzag technology. Work so boots. in your mind, picture a fucking Doc Martin. Are they purple or and white? A, you know, a fucking Timberland boot Bridges. that's got Bridges. plastic Bridges. zigzag Bridges. bottoms. It is the as wor- as worse as you can imagine. Just, just <laughs> think about how time ugly time. it is in your mind, and it's it's way uglier. <laughs> well, you don't believe me. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. And they have these like they have these like. Purple I was gonna say, there's some there's some dude is. out there fucking sporting that, and he's proud. Oh yeah. I don't know, man. But man, oh yeah. Man, man. He's he's like he's like. You'd, you'd be talking and he would just look at you and say, De gustibus non disputandum. <laughs> it's almost as bad as the... Hey, Mike, um, we're recording. Oh, we are okay. recording. I saw a picture. I posted to Facebook wall. It was a croc with toe slots and uh, a furry insulated center and it was pink. Did you all see right, that picture I posted? Right. Like the, the worst side. shoe ever made. It was probably not real, but it was all the ugly shoes you can think of, including Vibrams, forced into one item of apparel. Yeah. All right, don't... Uh, I think I just want to make sure I'm not going to butcher your last name on the air because I've done it before. I, just like out. I always mispronounce I just, it. Like, oh, yeah. Okay. That's what I was going to say. I just want to re-verify. Hey, if you get it right, I'm not sure anybody will know who I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Paul, call Paul, Paul, Paul E. How do, people usu- how do people usually say it? Ike, Eric, Ick, Etch. What, what's, the, uh, what's the origin? Well, it's German for oak tree, but we think <laughs> we think it's we think it's uh, let's see we think it's the Belgium Luxembourg route that our ancestors made it here. Well, in other words, so if, so if you're in Belgium or Luxembourg, you learn German, but it's a little bit different accent because you also know French and all kinds of other stuff. So you would say Eich instead of the German Eich. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're going with Eich. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe these fuckers are There you go. Aren't you sorry you asked? Is that, uh, is that too hot for you? What, what's the matter? No, no, I'm not feeling it. It's not part of my mojo today. What's the matter? Is it the level or is it just the headphone? Yeah, it's just the vibe. It's casting. I'm a vibe? soul. Really? I don't want to be having a fucking head squeeze. Maybe it's because You it's had hot. a soul? Yeah. <laughs> no, he doesn't. Sale at Walmart? Well, it's yeah. it's yeah. just a bunch of chemicals talking to each other. Fuck that soul. There you go. <laughs> I'll buy that. <laughs> Sometimes I'll just provoke for the sake of it. Oh, geez. So, like any good American. Right, right. You and Sam Adams. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, the guy who makes the beer? Yeah. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> um, yeah, that guy. Yeah. The. <laughs> Turn me off. So, yeah, focus. The, you want to you I gotta, like, cover I gotta some focus. of the stuff? Oh, yeah. Uh, All right, I'm going to do a little intro. You want to cover, so, cover <laughs> some of the broad <laughs> topics before we get into the <sighs> show or just wing it? I started just going to it. I don't know. We're all about winging it here, Paul. You'll see. <laughs> okay, now, yeah. Okay, now, you got, you got bearings about your blood, so you want to formally introduce this week's I Barbell do. Shrug podcast? All right, guys. Welcome to Ball Bar. <laughs> <laughs> ball Bar. That's ball easy for bar. you to say. Barbell Shrug. Yeah, Barbell Shrug. I'm barbell here with, shrug. Uh, this is Mike Bledsoe. I'm here with Chris Moore, Hello. James Chaney, with our guest, Paul H. And, uh, Nicely done. Thank you. Uh, we're going to roll into some weightlifting discussion because Paul wanted to talk about Olympic weightlifting elitism. You're going limp, Paul. <laughs> Already. Nobody, nobody wants that. Paul, Paul's mic went limp. I don't like these enough. mic stands at all. Not I think strong enough. All right. When we get our studio built, we're going to have our mic stands hanging from Did the ceiling. Did you get these out of like the, uh, the used bin or something? There were there was a cheap one. Cheap it's, it's, a consequence a of, of, it's a consequence of sharing these great ideas. They're heavy and hard to catch. Yeah, we'll go with that. The microphone. Mike, they can't handle it. Yeah. So, Paul, uh, Olympic weightlifting elitism in reference to CrossFit, or did you? Just, oh, I'm sorry about it. Did you introduce Paul? I missed it. If you did, I did. Okay, I totally missed it. You even Which, said my name right. Damn it! Stone, All right. Stoner All right. surfer I'm, hippie. I'm locked in. <laughs> I'm locked in from here on out. I haven't surfed in over a year or so. Oh, so you're a stoner. Well, he, did, he, just, he just got out of the Navy like a month ago. Actually, so. no, I, I surfed in September. That was the last time. All right. There you go. Well, CrossFitting, <laughs> uh, well, Olympic weightlifting, elitism, from the perspective of a CrossFitter, and what I, what I see is this. There's a whole culture of Olympic weightlifting, and it's a culture built around competing. In other words, if you're a competitive Olympic weightlifter, 
you're going to go OCD on anything that anybody ever thought might have a, ne a negative effect on your performance on the platform. Yep. Just like uh, if you're a bodybuilder, you know, you can't get up and walk across the street because it might uh, take a millimeter off your thighs. And so instead you get in a car and drive, right? Or some of that, uh, yeah. some of those other... We, we made that point before. I used to have that perspective. For, <laughs> for, for power lifters, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to get up and walk, that might decrease your squat performance and you wouldn't want to do that. So why walk? So you drive <laughs> fucking everywhere, right? Yeah, everywhere. So, so Olympic weightlifters, and, and, you know, I should say on the front end, I don't mean this in a disparaging way. I, I'd like to, I'd like to mean this in a way that's respectful of their discipline and their commitment to what they do. But while making that, or what with that respect also make the point that sometimes their discipline and their commitment to what they do means they give, advice I would disagree with as regards to crossfitting. So uh, you see a, a, a sort of elitist Olympic weightlifters that view every CrossFit movement from the lens of, would I teach this to my uh, fledgling Olympic weightlifters? Well, like, you know, the sumo deadlift high pole, for example, is one that gets picked on a lot, or the med ball clean. And... Well, the med ball clean... <laughs> <laughs> hey! No, I was going to point out, do you, is, this, is this targeted just towards... The implementation of other pulling movements, or is it, and how weightlifters view the execution of the actual lifts by CrossFitters? Two two topics, right? One's a little obvious, and one we've all heard, and one's a little maybe less obvious in terms of commenting on the implementation of other CrossFit activities. So, well, at its at its base, CrossFit is about being a generalist, not a specialist. So, you and, that, make, and that right there is what people don't get. They go, yeah. at, once a week, you'll see some guy, some dude, some bro. On the internet, saying, "CrossFit's so stupid. You shouldn't train an athlete like that, mm -hmm. or you shouldn't train like that for fucking right. weightlifting. Like, who don't said you, know, you would? Don't you know that Olympic lifts are to, to develop speed and power? I think you go, shouldn't be. If using you're going to develop for... your speed and power optimally, you need to focus and do X, Y, Z. But no shit. <laughs> right. I mean, who's who, thanks well, to the BFO? <laughs> then, like, right? I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not always a a strict champion for the CrossFit cause. I mean, I obviously think there's some things." not always correct and that's one of them but I'm, I'm the first to say no one in CrossFit no one is sitting there saying this is how you should train for your sport XYZ they're Pre saying if you want to be balanced in a little bit of everything you do this right yeah. and I don't know how anybody ever gets that confused Chris I, I've seen you do jump rope I mean that's your halfway to being a full fledged CrossFit I, can't, right I can do like one or two double unders <laughs> but I can fucking touch all day long 100, 200, 300 in a row, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but I am, I mean, but Take in that. all fairness to me, at being 305, a double under is a better achievement than if you're 180. I would like to know. <laughs> That's for sure. I would like to know how many horsepower are generated with two Chris double unders. You know that? <laughs> yeah. That's I can move be, okay when I need to move. Actually, I think uh, there's a website where we can input that data and it'll yeah. give us wattage. But yeah, as a, as somebody who's still, I won't come off of a power, yeah. I still compete in the sport of powerlifting from time to time. I don't buy in the mindset much anymore. I, I'm doing things for different reasons. But as somebody who's been competitive and has been immersed in the sport of weightlifting for a long time, my closest friends on the planet have studied it closely for years and are very good weightlifters. I researched it a lot in grad school. I followed it all the time. It's a great sport. <clears throat> that being said, other than CrossFit, here's my main point. Other than CrossFit, how is – what is that noise? There's a fucking dragon Some kind of TV show in there. Aside, aside, <laughs> from a CrossFit, aside from a CrossFit box, soccer mom, middle-aged salesman, insert any person who's beyond, uh, let's just say, even college age. Which one of these people are going to be exposed to any form or fashion, any shape of the clean and jerk or the snatch or, the, or even the deadlift or a proper squat? Who else is going to teach them these things? It's not going to be a global gym. Right. On a very rare occasion, somebody might live close to some proper sports conditioning facility. But there may be like fucking five of those in the continental United States. So right. It's going to be a global gym or a CrossFit box. And from that perspective, CrossFit is fighting a very, very great cause. And if it's not specialized, well, should fucking a 45-year-old soccer mom be specializing? <laughs> Only if or should she be dabbling to. a little bit of everything? Yeah. And does it make a shit if they catch their snatch on a bent elbow? Well, come on. It doesn't really matter. Exactly right, because the, the, the point is that, that her having the exposure to and the ability to learn and execute high comp, uh, really complex human movement, but sort of primal human movement, it's the, it's the human movement that generates the most force that you can in the human body. Well, in my view, that's a beautiful thing. 
And you know, people will make the the you know the where I get where I get hung up is as you pointed out, the the elites forget what the or don't grasp what the purpose of CrossFit is, which is so you can be a generalist. And as a generalist, that complex movement when you're exhausted is a tremendously potent stimulus for metabolic adaptation, but it's also a great uh, adaptation uh, to be able to concentrate and execute complex human movements when you're tired. Let's face it, uh, if you're fighting for your life, you don't need to be able to just be able to do this, move your arms up and down in a curl. You need to be able to throw punches and wrestle and uh, you know move your body in complex ways. You need to be able to generate force. And uh, you need to do, be able to have have exposure to doing that when you're exhausted. So I'm gonna. That's my argument with the what I what I call the Olympic weightlifting elitists is there is a purpose for doing Olympic weightlifting and CrossFit, and it's and it's a valid one, and it's very useful for somebody who wants to be a generalist, somebody and who wants the, to be fit. The visibility at CrossFit is just. I mean, just in the last year, it's pretty incredible. And like it or not, like it or not, there's probably ten times more kids seeing weightlifting because they're seeing on ESPN or something Absolutely. in the CrossFit Games than there were people catching the 2 a.m. showing of weightlifting on the Olympic reruns this right. summer in London. It'll yeah. be fucking 2.30 a.m. in the morning. That's redundant. Yeah, but shut up. 2.30 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> you'll stay up all night. You'll TV. You, you might catch a glimpse of like two clean jerks and they'll, they'll say, oh, this guy is so strong. Look how he picked up the weight. They won't know shit about weightlifting. Right. So compared to the dedicated exposure you get in, Cro- in CrossFit, in prime time now, and in Reebok fucking commercials, and uh, look, who, you're gonna have a, a bigger pool of talent to to develop real weightlifting talent in the future for the sport of weightlifting. Right, I think uh, I think our, our next wave of weightlifters are gonna come out of CrossFit gyms for sure. Yeah, yeah. they're not gonna come out. They've had a chance to come out of the local weightlifting gyms doing their best with the people around them locally. Right. It's not happening. The we pool, don't so have small. don't have the infrastructure of any other nation who devotes this much more focus towards sports like weightlifting. And in the and the, here's where the upside of uh, Olympic weightlifting elitism comes in, at least in so far as getting more Olympic weightlifters. And that is, everybody once you get just a little bit of exposure to authentic strength and conditioning, everybody picks up on the vibe that Olympic lifts are cool. They they're they're really cool. So if you put a bunch more athletes in a genuine strength and conditioning ath- uh, uh, environment like, is, like you should have in a CrossFit gym, you won't have to sell anybody on how cool clean and jerk and snatch is. They're going to get it. And some of them are going to just want to do that. So what do, you, what do you think about, um, and I come from a weightlifting background. I was weightlifting before I discovered CrossFit. And I, I first approached CrossFit and I was like, I can't believe they're doing high rep Olympic lifts. And, I met you near the that near the beginning. That sounds elitist. Yeah, actually, I think I, I think I, well, I've become uh, I've become much more understanding, and and CrossFit's developed yeah. as a sport too. Right. So like when it was just CrossFit.com and it wasn't a sport yet, I I so think also, I, I think there's a little bit more argument there. It's yeah, like so once, oh, you once know, that activity becomes specific to what you're competing, doing it makes doing sense. seventy yeah doing seventy five snatches at seventy five pounds for time. Probably not uh, the safest thing for the average person to be doing. Uh, I, I remember doing it myself and having. And I was thinking this is retarded um, near the beginning. But as it as the sport of CrossFit's developed, it, it's very obvious why you have to do the Olympic lifts during Metcons and all that kind of stuff. Um, I know that I still try to encourage new athletes to and and instead of doing the Olympic lifts, uh, doing like some kettlebell work the first few months of training and said, all right, do 10 clean and jerks at 135, then, you know, row and then come back and do more clean and jerks. I mean, what do you, how do you feel about that as far as, you know, using the kettlebells instead of the weights for, or the barbell um, for things like snatches during a Metcon until someone becomes, gets to a certain proficiency? Well, you, you're bringing me to, you know, the other thing I would probably think is worth talking about it uh, from my soapbox. And that is, the the subject of programming and you have the same effect of people that are so steeped in programming and maybe they take a lot of pride in programming and because of that they feel like it's important to to believe and to tell everybody else within hearing uh earshot that their programming is the best programming or they've got some leg up on everybody else in programming and (laughs) you know we should talk about programming elitism well uh, it's, (laughs) it's hand it's hand in glove but the you know but the 
the relevant thing is most of the, the people, elitist left wing programmers. <laughs> Most of the guys that <laughs> oh, would, someone's gonna start a website. <laughs> most of the guys that would tell you that that's a freebie. You that's a, a freebie drywall or a political party. <laughs> Dry, drywall is gonna take that one and run. Nice. <laughs> there you go. Hey, everybody, explode. watch Chris. He's, he's I put salt in my beer and I got the reaction. But it beer better. on everything in sight. <laughs> <laughs> so if so, if you take programming as an example, most of the people who will say, "Hey, my programming is better," or "Our programming is the best," or or make some claim like that, and in it, you know, hot dog for their confidence. But they're also steeped enough in the world of sports and exercise physiology that if they thought about it for four seconds, they would know there's no possible way they could actually assess that because it, the, the variables are infinite. What you'd really have to know if your programming is best is to know what is the athlete's potential and how close you got them to their potential and how, how long it took you. Sure. And, and, and nobody knows that. Yeah, so, I, I talked to an athlete today that wasn't happy with – um, her performance during one of the open wads. Okay. And we were kind of discussing, like, why she isn't performing at the level she kind of expected herself to. Yeah. And, of course, when you go into something like that, these are these are wads that you've never never done before. So how, there's no benchmark to measure yourself against. Mm -hmm. You only have others to measure yourself against, right? Yeah. So the expectations are depend on how other people perform. That's Not true. how you perform, really. Yeah. So... Uh, she was really concerned about that, and we were talking about programming, and I was, and then I kind of was like, well, you know, I know her nutrition's on point. She's been doing what I tell her to do, and then I asked her about sleep, and then I was right, like, right. ah, I don't get a lot of sleep. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm like, it's until you fix all those other things, it's hard to say it's the programming. Sure, like, you know yeah. what I mean? Well, what should I change in my training? I'm like, probably nothing. You probably need to change your recovery. Yeah. So you know, that that gets me opinionated about. When I hear CrossFit, it's about programming. Uh, I think I see guys who do just complete random shit all the time. So it's programming doesn't make any sense in that context. I program today the first 15 random fucking things I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a program. And, but, and then, but, then there's these guys, but then there's these, these group of guys who fancy themselves. Let's not name any names. No, I won't. Let me. No one wins when I do that. <laughs> there's this group. There's, this group <clears throat> there's a collective group. I mean, they're represented in every class of competitive athlete who just sure. overthinks everything and think they have a really awesome grasp of how to appropriately program, you know, an optimal response from the human body. And right. across it, there's these guys who fancy themselves highly enlightened exercise physiology motherfuckers <laughs> who have dissected this thing, you know, way, way too much. Like they, they just think they've got this all to, to mathematics and shit. It's like when I see people talk about like West Side Barbell training. Oh, it's all math. It's not fucking math. There are people who do things that are 100% easier, who just go into the gym and lift five more pounds than they did last time and get the same result. Yeah. There's a balance between not thinking about anything you're doing and just doing random shit and not even thinking about the future and then overthinking. But the true art form and programming, the periodization, whatever, is just recognizing that I'm... Honestly, at point X, I'm not gonna bullshit myself. I gotta get better at these wads <clears throat> or these basic skills that will make up most likely comprise a wad. I gotta get better with weightlifting, powerlifting, whatever. And then I know I would like to get there eventually to point Y. And I know that the first step towards that is one small, tiny inch in that direction. Yeah. And I do what I need to do just to get there. And that's fucking periodization. It's like I have a general plan <laughs> to add a little bit, let myself adapt, cool the jets, and then gear back up to make the next step. Yeah. These They're fucking guys who pretend like they've discovered some like no one has discovered shit that hasn't already been known, first of all. Like the physiology of your body is somewhat understood. But in terms of like putting a stimulus on you and getting a very predictable output with CrossFit especially, no one fucking fully grasps that. Why of course even, not. why even pretend to know that? Right. It's stupid. And if you say you know it, and you sell it in a fucking ebook, I really know you're an asshole. <laughs> so when you see somebody sell you an ebook with this secret to XYZ, they're basically saying, here's a piece of paper with a picture that says I'm an asshole. On it. Chris speaks with my inside voice. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's, and so that brings me to back to your question earlier about using kettlebells or using Olympic barbells in Metcons early on for an athlete. And what it's going to come down to is your taste and your best judgment as a trainer for your athletes. And for me, I want to get my athletes doing the Olympic lifts right when they come in the door. I don't know how long I'm going to have them. Uh, I, want to, I like the Olympic lifts because they are good human movement. 
You know, that if you can get yourself moving, uh, approximating a good Olympic lift, you're using good body mechanics. So if I give my 50 year old grandma who is just learning CrossFit a PVC and we start playing around with a burger to warm up for the first 15, part of my, part of my skills and drills for the first <laughs> part the of every session, <laughs> for her, that's the workout just doing that warm up first couple times. Well, for, you know, depending on their, their fitness level, you're right. It could be. <laughs> And of course, if they have horrible hip mobility, some of that's going to be a waste of time. They're not going to have a lot of, it's not going to be all that useful for them to be doing overhead squats with the PVC. But six weeks in, when I ask her to do uh, snatches the first time, she can do it. And she loves it. You know, and she's proud of it. And it's athletic movement for her. It's incredibly athletic movement for her. So as long as I don't give her a weight that's going to damage her, uh, right. then I think for me, it's, for me, it's useful. But... This gets back to the difference between programming and elitist programming. Everybody's got to figure out something to do with their clients to make them better. The mistake to me is in allowing yourself to think that you're smart enough to know that that's the absolute best thing you possibly could do. Oh, sure. There's a, there's a world of difference between saying, you know, I love the results my clients are getting in and saying, I'm the smartest motherfucker alive because that's just, you know, that's like, I know that's just not true. Every yeah. three months, <laughs> you're not the smartest. Every three months, yeah, I look exactly. back to what I was programming three months ago. And I'm like, like, <clears throat> I thought about this. I was like, you know what I had to do is go back. And uh, I was like, man, I'm, I've got the, today I was thinking this. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing such a good job with programming right now. <laughs> Wait, what I should do is I'm going to save this up and then I'm going to do what I'm programming for these other guys for CrossFit, right? But it's every time I do that, I look back three months and I was like, man, I'm, I was so stupid. Oh. I discovered like this new stuff that's even better. Yeah. So like, you know, you know in three months I can look back on what I'm programming today and be like, oh, or, you know, there's, there's some things I'm doing now that I wish I was doing. I had programmed three months Tra ago. Training you know? is tinkering. I mean, yeah, it's training, constant. Training is just a, a, a short scale version of any other tinkering procedure. So you're never done. You have to fuck up before you get any knowledge. You just that's don't right. learn it. You yeah. just don't go, oh, I've discovered a great way to train. No, you... You ruin yourself in some respect and go, well, I won't do that shit again. <laughs> yeah. So you don't let anybody else probably do it either. Right. Oh, yeah. Like every time I do five to ten bench press for three weeks in a row, my bicep tendons inflame like swollen ropey cords. I go, well, I can't do that shit. <laughs> in two years, I'll forget. I'll go, oh, I'll try some high rep benching. Then it'll, my bench will go to the shit. You know what's kind of interesting from an athlete's perspective because I actually do your programming, Mike. And I sometimes Sorry, wonder what the hell you were thinking when you program some of the things that you program. Yeah, I know. Um, You're but, my uh, little guinea pigs. Well, you know, it's it's weird because from an athlete's perspective, whether you follow OPT or you follow a any coach, whatever, even if it's just main site, I think most people, most people who follow programming, whatever it is, assume that the person programming knows what the hell they're doing and knows that they're doing these things for a purpose. Oh, yeah. So it's interesting to hear people say that, well, we're just tinkering and we're well, still trying to figure this well, out. Everything I do program is for a purpose. There, There's a baseline of, of knowledge that goes into that. I know that sure, certain sure. things need to be happening, but if I'm not constantly tinkering, then the programming is not going to improve ever. Well, and, so and I think the point where, of all this that's is... That's where feedback gets in really important. Right. And I get really pissed <clears throat> off a lot of times. I, get, I usually get feedback, you, like 50% you're, of the time. You're better than most. Oh, hey, all you assholes at home. Give <laughs> <laughs> feedback. Base. Comment. <laughs> Not everyone that's li listening, just people at Faction. Right. Um, put your results in the comments. It's useful. It's yeah. good to know how long it took to do certain intervals. It's good for me to know that kind of stuff so that I can adjust the training. If I don't get any feedback, it I'm I'm in I'm in the dark essentially. Well, it's interesting too because I think the point of or kind of the to summarize what you're saying is that there's no magic formula to produce the perfect athlete or the perfect right. you know whatever. There's a CrossFit Journal article. I wish I could remember the name of it. Um, I printed off a couple copies to hand out a while back. It talks about just that. I think it went over four different CrossFit athletes, interviewed them all. Yeah, it was, and yeah. you remember the name of it? It's been two months ago, and it was by Hillary, I believe, Hillary Ackauer. And uh, it was really good. I thought I was like, man, I wish every athlete would read this because every athlete, you know, they always have that. Am I doing the right thing? Yeah, this and that. And you know, they interviewed one guy that all he did was CrossFit.com. Yeah, and then you had someone else that did CrossFit.com. <laughs> Plus, whatever happened, you know, if they felt good that day, they were going <clears> to <throat> jump in the wad at their gym. This is the same thing, though, and, that, that every competitive athlete deals with. Like, people obsess about if they're doing the right thing to be as strong as possible, like in powerlifting or weightlifting. Right. Yeah. And they obsess about looking at the training of other people. What are they doing in Korea? What are they doing in Bulgaria? 
you know, uh, and I'll start incorporating that into my training. Yeah. Therefore, I will be like I, them. I do less and less of that now. But the thing is, there are people who <laughs> overthink their training. Yeah. There are people who put no thought into their training. There are people who do a little bit of this and that. Train five days, train three days, train fucking one day. And they all can either screw up or achieve world record events. So, yeah. here's, so here's one of the things that it boils down to, and that is a lot of the people that are intense enough and OCD enough to, to excel in coaching have no tolerance for uncertainty in their lives or in what they're doing at all. And, it, and what it looks like to me is as a defense against uncertainty, they'll just say, oh, yeah, I know it all. And, I've, you know, I've got the best program. It's not reality. Mm-hmm. It's just what they need to feel for themselves to meet their own human needs. Right. So, you know, I, I can't even pick a fight with Chris about programming elitism because we basically believe the same thing. <laughs> I want to hear a fight. Yeah. <laughs> More entertaining. Uh, we, We'll have to find something we disagree on, Chris. You know, I don't know. But, yeah, after after well, watching I mean, other athletes, you're, like you're best... after programming for other athletes and seeing them be basket cases about programming, yeah. it makes me way less of a basket case. I used to be just like that. What they do? What did Bulgarians do? What are they doing at California Strength? Who, what are they the doing? Where, is who fucking cares? And then yeah. and that's the truth. And the thing is, is I'll, I'm over here like worrying about this, and then I have my athletes come to me and like. Wor- you know, worrying my ear off because of this or that that's going on somewhere else. You need to get, and I'm going, you need, you need the same quote. shit. You need to get that quote from Ripto's book. Where, Wh- which one is that? Uh, and I can't remember if it's practical them. programming <laughs> or, or starting strength. but The quotable Ripto. The, 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 <laughs> yeah. the, base, the gist of it is this. You know, most people start on a plan, and before they even really get far enough down the road on that plan to know what it's going to do for them, they they get bored and try something else. So they essentially oh, yeah. never figure anything out. Shiny they object no syndrome. Line. Yeah, exactly mm-hmm. right. And it is, doesn't it, actually matter what the program is. You just have to stick with it long enough to see the outcome of the experiment. Exactly. Which is a lot longer than most athletes. It's like science. <laughs> have an idea about what you want to demonstrate. Do a couple of experiments. Collect the evidence. Review it. And then decide what study you'll do next. Take two, it, takes, it takes too long, Chris. Yeah, Shit. but this, but that, that's another thing. People want to, like, I want to come in the gym today and be out of shape, weak piece of shit. And then tomorrow, I want to be Rich Froning. Get out of here. It's just not going to happen. I, I hate right. to be the guy. I hate to run you out of here by telling you this, but it's just not going to happen. I well, talked, to, talked to Rich last week, or two weeks ago, and he, we were talking, about him about, talking to him about training. I guess they have like a, he and Dan Bailey are training together now. And he was just telling me that, they have a semi-structured strength program, which consists of the Olympic lifts if they feel like it. That's why I say semi-structured. Right. Um, and then they just do whatever Metcon they feel like doing that day. And these are the, like the two of the best dudes in the whole yeah. world. Yeah. They got a couple things working they're for one. percentile. I mean, Rich is, yeah. Rich is, oh, yeah. They're 99.99 they're percentile at, they're, for they're sure. They're athletes to start. They, are, they believe themselves, secondly. They have incredible talent. And they train really hard. So then the actual things you do with those things in mind don't really matter that much. Matters a lot less, doesn't it? You know, yeah. He can fucking eat donuts all day and beat your ass on any wad because he's Rich not like you. <laughs> you are, he's not me. You are, you are normal, and he's not normal. It's like why you could train really hard and lose to, in a fight to a bear who never trains. Fucking bear. <laughs> people need to, but people need to get that. But I want to beat the bear. People need to understand <laughs> that you, you are where you are and you are who you are. So what if I train like train? a bear? Eat salmon straight out the creek. Probably well, pretty fucking yeah. good training program. <laughs> are you saying I should just accept the way I am well, and look, not if you, if you don't, have if you don't, no hope for improvements? <laughs> no, no, no. I'm saying you have to accept who you are. So if you're a beginning CrossFitter. And you haven't trained in two or three years, or you've never exercised, and you've spent two years packing on weight or longer, and you currently eat like shit, and you have just now learned what a snatch is, you have to recognize that your next immediate step will be to you know snatch an empty bar with no weight with decent form. Yeah. Not to do it 100 times perfectly so you can post a decent score on the 12 point whatever wad. You'd be embarrassed if you don't get this number you're thinking of. No, you have to just start with the next reasonable step. Yeah. Now, I'm not day. saying that in two years you can't be a fucking killer CrossFitter because that I've seen that shit happen. I've seen complete oh, yeah. beginners in one to two years, which just may surprise the audience. That's not a lot of time. Right. <laughs> that's a in flash. Training, that's a flash world. Yeah. yeah. But in two years, you can go from not knowing what the fuck a clean jerk is to clean jerking to you know, over your body Macklin. weight. Yeah. That's yeah. incredible. Yeah, it is. That's really incredible. Well, that, that's the beauty of my friend uh, David Chef Wallach who, said, who, uh, who quoted... Stronger today than yesterday, stronger tomorrow than today. 
Mm-hmm. I, you can't tell yourself that enough. And, and that's, as, not, hmm. that's, not, that's not meaning today I did a 100 kilo clean jerk, tomorrow, 110 kilos. Because I believe it. No, it means, right. it, it even means I snatched, you know, 100 pounds barely today. And then next week I want to do it with just Confidence. this much cleaner form yeah. or a little bit quicker. It ain't yeah. even about the weight. It's about some marker that you got better. That's a great point. Because that shit adds up a lot in just a few months. Yeah. Like I go, okay, I want to do, show more progress this week. If I do the same weight faster, I've, I'm better. And that I, is a I good know point. it's faster. A lot of people there's, don't there's think about that. There's lots of ways to measure. They're just about the pounds on the bar. Yeah. That's yeah. for sure. And that's a wrong way to proceed because usually if you just keep on trying to add weight all the time, uh, you're going to well, stall. Well, that works for a while. And if you stall, you got to be disciplined enough to back off. It, it is amazing how how somebody who hasn't trained comes in and trains and like they'll see prog- like monster progress yeah. for six months. Yeah. You know, and then it starts to kind of level off a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah. it always <laughs> does. And I almost have to warn people. I can, I can see it coming. You know, they get, I can see that they're getting really excited, yeah. and that's their motivation for training. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, just so you know, it's not going to last forever. I used yeah. to PR every time I walked in the gym. <laughs> right, I'm and that's when if you keep, if you keep pushing that direction, it's sort of like, uh, you know, the faster and faster you dive in the water, the harder it's going to hurt. Like the faster you keep pushing that direction, the more you're going to get fucked up. Mm. So you have that, but this one's you step way back and say, okay, I recognize what's going on. I got good coaches to help guide me. Take a couple steps back, repolish, rethink about what I need to do, add in a few variations, and now I take the next steps. Like that's that's how periodization actually works. That's how you go from training like a beginner to an intermediate person. Because the only thing that separates somebody who's a beginner from somebody who's really fucking advanced, like Rich, or you know, uh, world qu- c- caliber weightlifter, power out there, is that. You can come in the gym and get better at everything every time you fucking come in the gym if you're a beginner because yeah. <clears throat> you're so under your abilities. But with time, it gets harder and harder and harder to adapt to your increasing level of ability. And it doesn't hurt any less. Yeah. So you, you have to step, take steps back, evaluate where you're at, then slowly add work back in. And that, you got to relearn that, how to proceed. That same pattern applies to how you coach athletes too. So mm-hmm. that you got to, you know, it seems, it just seems to me as I, you know, keep coaching, keep learning how to, you know, train myself because I do the majority of my own coaching. In other words, I just don't avail myself of all the good coaching resources around, so I end up trying to do my own effort to improve myself. Too busy. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. So, the, <laughs> so the I think the you should upside, neglect your wife and kids personally. Well, I'll, I'll take that under advisement. <laughs> so, uh, the point of that, all that is that. What I, what you keep what you learn as quote unquote the way to squat when you're first learning how to squat or learning how to coach other people how to squat, pretty soon you learn there's four different ways to squat and they're all legit and they apply to a slightly different circumstance. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, this is a difficult thing for people to pick up. They want they really especially people that are passionate and maybe a little bit over over OCD and probably the perfect person to CrossFit in the first place because they're a little bit nuts. They want there to be a way to deadlift and a way to squat and a way to press and a way to jerk. And the truth is there's probably five or six or more legitimate ways to do it. And it's going to vary by your maturity as an athlete and your anthropometry and, uh, you know, a bunch of other factors. And, and, and maybe even just based on what you want to do. For example, box squatting is a, uh, is a whole different skill set than regular squatting. It has a totally different purpose. And, you know, it's not like box squatting is wrong and free squatting is right. I mean, it's just a different tool. Yeah. I think a good example of how you can apply it is that, you know, if I was going to go back, this would be stupid and idiotic. But if I was going to play football again, <laughs> now, if I, I could probably. I would love to see that. I could probably I physically think, do a better think, job now than I want to I, I think you should go to the Nothing semi-pro like, football league here in town. But if I was, was going to play, I might entertain doing the box squat much more frequently. Not that, I mean, I squat frequently now with. A, f- a free squat form, all kinds of forms. Yeah, I'm a fan of the box squat for but, football, but, for okay, sure. Yeah, good thing is it looks pretty much exactly yeah. like what you'll do if you're like offensive lineman. Yeah. Right? You you sit, you pause for a long period of time, and you go from a complete dead pause, yeah. a relaxed position, to a violent explosion. Yeah. And it has the side effect of not making you sore at all no matter how much you fucking do it. You can sit mm. down on a box and stand up and not have any – it kind of takes out some of the stretch. Mm. So you don't get a whole lot of eccentric loading, and you can squat a lot more often. Mm. Now, will your free squat form and your ability to bounce out of the bottom or catch a clean, go to shit? Yeah. But if you're an offensive lineman, guess what? You don't really care. You just need to go from no movement 
to lots of forceful movement yeah really quickly so it's a, it makes perfect sense to do that yeah yeah i used to be much more uh i guess uh opinionated about how football strength coaches program until i started programming for football players i go oh yeah. Well, if we want to get results, <clears throat> or if you're, I can't up, teach these guys snatches. Or if that's you're, or if you're way up there, <laughs> like, that's where I used no to get on way. to my former colleagues. I'd, I'd, they'd get really, they go, well, "If you're an athlete, why do you need to do bench pressing? Or why do you need to do? Why wouldn't you only do jerks and front squats and and clean pulls?" I go, "Well, I mean, I play football, and I know that having strong arms is really important. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if I if I can if two guys squat good weight." And two guys clean okay, and one guy benches three, and one guy benches 450, which I play with a lot of guys who bench like 450. Someone yeah. couldn't squat and then use their arms to still to great effect. But if you can squat, if you can bench 450 pounds, you're a defensive lineman, and you can fight off with one arm a fucking block from a 300 pound guy. That has its utility. Yeah, right. and you can probably do that assuming that you are an athlete who's playing football. You probably have the ability to brace yourself and hold a good position while you push with this arm. But there, there's no wrong and right way to use certain tools. Bench pressing is great. And some people, one guy told me, you never, you never lay down on your back and push up in, a, in your sport. So why bench in the, in the, in the gym? There's why con- not? Do, I go, that's dude, you're, you're, elitism. You're, uh, you're forgetting about fucking gravity. <laughs> you have to lay on your back to bench. <laughs> <laughs> this is the stupidest fucking thing I've ever heard. That's yeah, what, that's, it's what the a, hammer it's strength, that's what the hammer strength machine's for. Does Chris. it replace? Yeah, they go, why bench when you can do the jammer? You see what the jammer is? Yeah, yeah. What's the it jammer? Looks, it I don't know. looks like what you do in football. You sort of stand up and you push these two oh, machine arms. Yeah. I go, mm. okay, I, bench pressing, even though it doesn't look like something, bench pressing or especially incline pressing is way better than that fucking machine called a jammer. It is. I'm fine, well, fi- trying to find a way to And if you're to a big weight there and you've got a weak lockout, you're not comfortable holding weights, or you don't, you can't jerk with enough weight to really give your arms a workout. If you, after you do your lifts, if you go do an incline press or some bench pressing, you don't make it a huge or, focus. But if you do that, your jerk could improve greatly. You, you can press that. more than you can overhead press. That's a given. And there's always there's it's definitely a good tool for loading the muscles that press. Every even tool if it's has not the same time. exact direction. Yeah, yeah that's, a that's an example it. of fucking but, overthinking. But Chris, put that on the spectrum with all of the guys who love to bench press and can't jack, can't do jack with exactly. a squat or a deadlift. And I used to love bench pressing, and now I really hate bench pressing. Because <laughs> bench pressing is the only exercise that fucking really hurts. Mm. I, my bicep tendons, I can... Well, I, there's an argument that it's not natural movement, that's for I sure. I didn't train to bench all year, and if that meet, I benched for three weeks... My shoulder health really deteriorated. My standing press went way down. But I, I squeaked out a close grip 400 bench at that meet with a long pause, but really paid for it. Like I, My delts were jacked up for a week after. It took me four weeks to recover just from focusing on a bench again. But I can incline press probably three days a week, two max, no pain ever. Hmm. Hmm. And plus, if I incline press, my standing press goes up. If I bench press, nothing happens to my standing press. Yeah, but no, good, there's certain exercises know. that are yeah. very good, very very good for their own benefit. But yeah. Chris, no high school wants to know what your incline two rep max That's is. A shame. The only thing incline, they want to know incline is a pretty badass bench? exercise. How much do you bench? The, it's if true. You, if you incline, if you spend all your time inclining, your press will go up and your bench will go up. If you spend all your time pressing, you, your incline press will still go up and your bench will go up because your arms and shoulders what, are strong. What, if you it, bench what? only. Your incline and your fucking yeah, but that's will not that's move. not the issue at hand. The real issue is, is it going to make my pecs bigger? Yeah, <laughs> your testicles big enough. <laughs> I think if you, if you that train, is what really matters. If you could train to where you could do like a three hundred pound incline press, your chest is big enough. <laughs> All right, next goal to have: win at weightlifting and then incline bench press. It is interesting, you know, people that just train just for aesthetics, just for looks. I mean, bench press is their, you know, that, that's their golden ticket right there. Nobody yeah. cares how big their thighs are, you know, or their <laughs> close. Or back. how good their hip function is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, so you usually don't see those folks again, doing uh, squats. Or- assuming you can clean explosively or pull explosively with good form and you can squat with good form, doing some benching and whatever you want to do in any way you want to do it is a great thing. All you do is bench, you're an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> that's just, I'm sorry. 
Uh, and, I don't, and you could bench 700, but if you can't, if you never do anything else, you're, you're just an asshole, man. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, guys, let's go ahead and take a break real quick, and then we'll reconvene with uh, some good topics. You forgot to mention, you forgot to mention that CTP, <laughs> CTP will play a really cool video for you. Oh, starting. yeah, CTP is going to play an excellent yeah. video. Put that pressure on me now. <laughs> you love the pressure, man. Come on. I'm Doug Larson. On April 21st, we're going to be hosting the Faction Strength Seminar. The main goal of the Faction Strength Seminar is going to be how to gain functional strength without getting stiff, bulky, or losing your fitness. In this seminar, we're going to answer common questions like, what are the best exercises to gain strength without getting too big? We're also going to talk about how to get stronger for some of the key gymnastic skills of CrossFit, like pistols, muscle-ups, and handstand push-ups. We're gonna talk about how to get stronger without losing your fitness or endurance. We'll also talk about exactly what to eat before, during, and after your strength workouts to maximize your strength gains. If you PR every single week and you look like a movie star, even when you skip workouts, eat like crap, and don't get any sleep, then you probably don't need this seminar. However, if you used to hit a PR almost every other week, but now you can't remember the last time you hit a squat, deadlift, or clean PR, then you absolutely need to come to this seminar. We're hosting the seminar from nine till four p.m on April 21st here at Faction Strength and Conditioning. The cost is $69 for non-members and $59 for Faction members. If you attend the entire seminar and you don't think it's worth every single penny, I will give you a 100% refund, no questions asked. If you're interested in attending, you can come here to Faction Strength and Conditioning and speak to one of the coaches or one of the staff members. You can also call the gym. The phone number is 901-246-9451. Or probably the easiest option is to go to factionsc.com. Look for the Faction Strength Seminar link under the upcoming events section of that main page. And you can pay using PayPal or Google Checkout. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at doug at factionsc.com. And I hope to see you there. Yeah. Just post at the end of the video. Right, it's getting hard and harder to pull sh the wool of people's eyes. And Great less... fucking liberation will come. Well, <laughs> brothers. But what you see is people want to be willing accomplices to the deception. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's hard to overcome. I think it's usually the older Coney folks, 2012. though. I think. I, I, I think. Coney, if, motherfucker. Oh my god. I, I got my. I got a whole fucking. If you, if, if you saw my Facebook today, you'd know my whole opinion on the whole Coney thing. Oh, look. Shit. 25 years. I've known about that for a long Dude, fucking time. Here's my point. People here's find out about it and they're like, oh my god, yeah, we have to do something. Lots like, of no bad shit. People. There's lots of bad people in the world. Yeah, yeah. My point is, there's people who watched it and liked it. I actually thought it was really great. I, I thought it was good. But yeah, it's at good. the same time. And then people go, hey man, you guys should fucking think about what you post to Facebook. Not just, just post it because you watched it. Here's a link to some blog that I just fucking read, and I believe this. <laughs> that's my well, that's my main ironic observation. Like, <clears throat> I just read a, a, a blog in two minutes. And now I believe that I'm enlightened. You should not give the Coney. There was a versus the guy who just watched a thirty minute video. I, now I, he's an expert on geopolitics. I posted something on Coney, and there was a you know the the action figure. What's it called? AFT. The action figure, whatever. Uh, Justin Key actually posted that on there. And there's like this whole YouTube video where an action figure is talking about the whole Coney 2012 thing. And it's right on, which is hilarious. Did you see the picture? Mm. Of it's the, really funny, but it's right on. It's like, it's like there's a meme why don't we just hire some mercenaries? Whatever. And it's like, but it, it's, 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 a, it's a little more complex than that. But at the same time, like, <laughs> this it's, like it's like all these assholes. You got all these kids standing there with signs. How about we buy them a plane ticket to Africa and an AR-15 and let them go get Coney? Oh, if you that. believe so strongly in it. Why don't you go do it? Oh, did you no, see no, 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 no. I just want to petition my government so they'll send the military. Did you see the meme? It's like, yeah, that, you feel real strongly did you about see the that. The meme don't that you? popped up last Friday on, on Facebook. The meme that popped up was people took pictures of Carl Weathers from Predator. Oh, yeah, I saw that. Posted a lot and <laughs> said, uh, I love this guy. It's like a great experiment, like 100 people did. Right, right. No, he's supposed to, How could you, motherfucker? You don't know anything about. The atrocities this guy's committed. He's got <laughs> child armies that are cutting off arms and killing their parents. Like, I don't think Carl Weathers from Predator has a child army. <laughs> <laughs> That's how amazing some people yeah. are. They didn't even know about Coney. Now they're a master of it. They can't even... They don't remember the movie Predator came out. Yeah. That's what's so awesome about people. Oh, but here's a, here's a great lesson all that. I've never seen Predator. In, in 24 hours, 40 million people can become aware of something. 
If it that is pretty if amazing. It's the right core. Hey, that's when awesome. I, when that's, I woke that, up, that's, that, that's crazy stuff, man. When I woke up, it was already big. I was like, shit. And like forty five of my friends are posting excuse, this. I definitely realized I'm over bias. thirty when it took me till today to watch that video. Excuse okay. the biases. And excuse the fallacies and thought and some of the, like, excuse the fact that somehow Hitler gets brought up in a Coney video. I mean, he had nothing to fucking do with Coney. <laughs> like, excuse all these errors and these reaches and, and all this stuff. But a bad guy is now known to 40 million people who didn't fucking know who he was the day before. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. All, all right, guys. Fast. Yep. All right, guys. Uh, welcome back to uh, Barbell Shrug. We, uh... We seem to rope in CTP to be one of the people on a mic. We'll see if he actually says anything. Hey, CTP. Hello. Uh, still have Paul Eich here. We haven't kicked him off yet. Uh, I'll have Paul, to try harder. Why don't, uh, yeah, you, you got to piss us off, man. <laughs> you got to. I want an argument. No, man. We need, um, yeah. Controversy. Dude, yeah, we need the controversy. It's okay. a bro, it's a bro uh, fest right so now. So you were telling us, you started to tell us a story during the break, but. We had to say We that. were like, oh, <clears throat> this is, this guy going on the podcast. We only heard the first 10 seconds. We were like, ah! I'd say two seconds. <laughs> two seconds. All right. right, Paul, let's hear it. Some legend. This better be good. No pressure. Go. <laughs> so, so Chris, not, not totally unresembling of a bear, mind you, tell, starts to tell a bear story. And in the same vein, I posted on Facebook the other day this nifty video of a hunter who's got a bear that climbs up his tree stand. And all he does is lean over and says, what are you doing, man? And the bear turns around and runs off. So we got a bear thing going on in our, in our lives here. But uh, so there's an ancient, uh, there's a great legend of an Okinawan uh, karate man who uh, trained the king's son or, or, or something like that. I mean, just legendary across Okinawa. So the king uh, decides that a fitting challenge would be for a great warrior like himself to defeat a bull in the ring for some sort of celebratory event for the king. <laughs> Well, this sounds like this sounds like the plot for uh, Gladiator. Could, could, well, maybe they stole it from this story. Probably. You know? So, so the guys the guy's a great martial artist, but he's thinking, hmm, let's see, 125 pound Okinawan, a uh, thousand pound side of beef. Maybe maybe this isn't a great battle to pick. No. So, he finds out what bull they're going to use for the fight, and he goes and pays the stallkeeper for the bull, and he, and he has him chain the bull down. And he walks over and he gets up in the bull's face and he lets the bull get a good sniff of him. And he stibs, stabs a needle in the bull's nose. Of course, motherfucker, this yeah. is Gladiator. <laughs> so, Gladiator probably stole that, that plot twist from this fucking story. No, probably did. <laughs> I've never seen that either. I don't know so, what you're talking about. You so, ever seen the movie Gladiator? Yeah, he injures him before he fights him. The, king, the emperor goes after the lead character. In a oh, final bro. fight to prove that this guy was uh, not but, worthy. But not a bull. And before the Gladiator I'm fight, not good he at takes those kinds of things together. and he stabs... He well, fucking stabs the guy in the lung and creates a wound to, to, stay, to try to de- defeat the animal preemptively. Well, go ahead. S- stay with me just a minute. It's a little different. It's the same idea, but a little different. So Wrong. Every, <laughs> bottom line is, every day that the warrior goes back, has the bull chained down, stabs him in the nose with a pen. The, the bull gets enraged, but he can't do anything about it. So within a, within a couple of weeks, by the time the guy walks in the, in the cave, the bull is just standing there shivering because he knows what's coming and he knows he can't do anything about it. So the big day comes... They let the bull out in the ring, and he's all stomping and snorting and pawing and getting ready to put, put the major beat down on whatever crosses his path. And the warrior walks out into the ring and just walks right up to the bull, and as soon as the bull gets a whiff of him, he turns and runs. Psychological warfare at its finest. So, oh, yeah. Now, from that legend, you got uh, another legendary. It was actually a Korean. His name was Masoyama, and he studied uh, Shotokan karate. And broke away from Shotokan and, and became Kyokushin, which I think he called the true high method. And as part of Kyokushin, he would fight bulls in the ring. And he killed 50 of them. But, you know, mano a bull, kind of. Holy shit. It was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Super cool. So, so he gets a little bit bored with killing bulls and decides, uh, I want to up the ante a little bit. Gets in the ring with a bear. This is a true story. True story. Well, I mean... Legend. I mean, it was told to me by martial arts people that I trust. Is it on YouTube? With. <laughs> Chris, it might be by now. <laughs> no pictures. Here's the, no video didn't happen. <laughs> here's, the short, here's the short version of what happened to Mazo Yama, man who killed 50 bulls in the ring. After a short while, he was taken to the hospital where he stayed for one year. But, you know, and so you know, I was wondering if that's how you were thinking about why, you got, you got why men should, about a bear, right? Yeah, exactly. Why a man should not fight a bear. <laughs> Yeah, a bear. Well, you know, uh, 
just just to kind of go into why bears are so awesome. Do you remember that? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> our friend Professor Galpin uh, here in yeah. spirit uh, did his PhD studies at he's not Ball dead. State. Yeah, he's not dead, people. <laughs> he's alive, but also here in spirit. His soul <laughs> is with us. But he, he he did his studies in muscle physiology at Ball State University, a very fine university and a very good program for human performance. But they did a little study on on muscle bear. Uh, a bear muscle protein sample. Sorry, muscle bear. That's a new energy drink for fraction. <laughs> but basically, he found okay. Obviously, bears have more muscle mass than you. You are a hundred. How much do you weigh, Bloodson? One seventy-five. Okay, you're one hundred seventy-five Weak. pounds, pretty lean. So we can suppose that the majority of your weight is one hundred sixty. Yeah, so one hundred sixty pounds of muscle and bone. Yeah, let's assume right? you were all pro. Let's say assume you're all muscle. One hundred seventy-five pounds of all muscle. I am. Well, a bear is all muscle as well. <laughs> Uh, but weighs like fucking a thousand pounds or more. So that's a very big animal to be muscled. So assuming that this, the quality of muscle is the same, he has an advantage. It's like if you went against a thousand pound man who was all muscle, it's not good. But the cool thing about bear muscle is that in the same cross section sample, the same unit of measure, there's like twice the cross bridge formation, or maybe I've three times that. the cross bridge formation. Right, so basically, like that. the same amount of muscle contracts more forcefully and more efficiently and faster. So, a bear is also x times your size, and also x times more efficient with that size. And then you add on the fact that he's got giant fucking razor sharp claws yeah, on that's... the end of his hands. <laughs> and basically, what you have is something that you should never get near. Right. Yeah. <laughs> in any respect just don't do it 300 which, which brings me back to that commercial they played on the Super Bowl a while back where that guy is fishing for salmon and he ends up fighting the, the bear for it and kicks oh, him in the nuts yeah, yeah. <laughs> hilarious <laughs> alright so uh, got a got a couple questions uh, yeah actually uh, fucking go see Gladiator too you'll get what I'm saying whatever are you working for fucking Gladiator what's going on <laughs> no I'm just saying just watch it. Is it sounds solid? like a man if you crush. Is it seen on it, Netflix? You go, yeah, of course like it's on Netflix. <laughs> well, I don't mean like where they send you the <laughs> you DVDs. Never, I'm talking about instant stream. You've never seen Gladiator. Sure haven't. Have you ever seen Braveheart? <laughs> I wish I could say I did, but no. Oh, Jesus, man. I've seen South Park's Braveheart. <laughs> <laughs> what do they South teach Park's kids in school these days? No shit. Well, it's like should be last watching week. movies. In that same vein, I've seen 300, but that shit was weak. Was it the movies of today or like the books of yesterday? Well, it's like, Anyways. I, I'm all up to assume now that young people know what I'm talking about when I reference an 80s action movie or a classic <laughs> rock band or even fucking like, even like Van Halen or whatever. I mean, they, they go, who? Dude, the, ba- all- the band Train. You never heard the band Train. Everybody knows Train, a poppy ass band. Oh, yeah, terrible. But they're not, no, but here's the thing. Humble maybe maybe you don't like the original music, but the band itself is actually very talented. And one of the things they used to do. He used to play really killer Led Zeppelin covers. If you type in train cover Led Zeppelin, you'll hear oh, awesome, really? awesome, awesome Led Zeppelin covers. But say, I had to quit doing it at, at shows because kids that come to see you sing Hey Soul Sister mm. have no fucking clue who Led Zeppelin is. Well, they go, we're, or we're what paying you, to see they go, you. what is this band? You go, it is an awesome cover we're doing. Like nobody even claps when you get through it. Like, what was that? <laughs> I wouldn't give a shit how good their cover was. If I want to hear Zeppelin, I want to see Zeppelin. I don't want to see train fucking but, play. Look, no, look, but look. If you show up live and you see a good cover of a solid rock album, you're gonna or a, a track you're gonna really like it. And they do a really good cover, as far as covers go, and no one knew what the fuck they're talking about. Like, Led Zeppelin haters. So haters. Paul, <laughs> so what? I want I want to hear I want to hear Paul's. I, I got a I got a some some uh, kid that was training with us back last summer. He's at uh, UTC UT, UT Chattanooga, and. Uh, He's in the exercise science department there, and I guess there was some kind of like strength and conditioning forum with you know local coaches, and I guess it, it ended up being an issue at one of the schools that one of the football coaches at one of the high schools was having kids or sixth graders, six not high school, cool. sixth graders drinking um, vegetable oil <laughs> <laughs> after football practice to put on weight. Uh, I think we're all aware that's probably work? not a great idea, <laughs> but maybe you could explain why it's a terrible, yeah, terrible idea. Well, the, the short version is that, that uh, vegetable oils are uh, highly oxidizable. That's I mean, it's it's as you as you look at them and they're the way they react in the body or react when you're cooking with them. It's a stunner that anybody ever thought it might have been a good idea to use these things, and so the short version is they when you when you 
eat a lot of PUFAs, a lot of polyunsaturated fat, fatty acids, which is prim primarily these uh, industrial vegetable oils, what they are, they go to, they, they become incorporated into the cell walls. And as they get exposed to oxidizing agents in, in, as part of a cell, they oxidize rapidly. And, in, you know, one example of how that, could, that, that, uh, that as a basis for a medical model of heart disease is if you get LDL particles that have a substantial part of the cell wall made up of PUFAs, they oxidize rapidly. And then once they become out oxidized, they, they work in the body somewhat like broken glass. So glass, very useful when it's whole, but once you break it or oxidize it, it becomes uh, damaging. It becomes high risk. You've got to handle it really carefully. Well, it goes flying around your bloodstream, banging into the artery walls. And so this model uh, uh, would posits that, that those highly oxidized LDLs banging into the artery walls call dam cause damage. The body's natural response then is to send out cholesterol, to repair the damage in the cell walls, which gives you the plaque buildups, which is part of your uh, coronary artery, artery disease or or vascular disease in general. Same thing applies to stroke. So you just got served, <laughs> listener. <laughs> so here's the good news: uh, your body has a pretty amazing capacity to heal. So hopefully, these sixth graders will stop drinking massive quantities of vegetable oil. Although I've heard some people say that even a teaspoon a day is a toxic dose of these things. Uh, but hopefully they'll stop and, and if they do, they, they're, there's a good reason they'll heal. One of the downsides they're gonna see as football players is as these fatty acids become part of their cell walls, they're gonna see a lot of inflammation based on that uh, oxidized particles flying around. A lot more pain than they need to, a lot slower recovery. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> then the, you know, the thing that, that this brings where this connects the dots for me is it's the uh, sadness or the insanity of a government agency endorsing any dietary strategy when they know and we know that there is no proof in science. In other words, for the last 30 or 35 years, they've been endorsing stuff like, you know, vegetable oils that are that were thought by some to be quote unquote healthy oils. Well, they're they're from vegetables. They got to be good for you, right? Oh, right. <laughs> well, you know because makes it, sense. It's really easy. You just take some corn and squeeze it. And you get <laughs> you get vegetable oil, right? So the last time I did it, that's that's exactly what happened. Sure. Yeah. Is this team winning games or what? That would be a, that would be an interesting metric. <laughs> Because um, we can end this right now. If, yeah, I gotta, they're winning. I, they lose every game because all their players are injured. I got a, I got a tip for the coach. Anyway. Right. So that, that begs the question, though. So if you're, aside from not doing the, the drinking of the vegetable anymore, what would you recommend they do right now to help themselves counter the tragic, deleterious effects of this idiotic, <laughs> stupid-ass coach? <laughs> By the way, I mean, I'm sure if he's doing this, he's not executing a well-thought-out, reasonable strength and conditioning program <laughs> or anything else. But let's start with countering. Like, these kids, what can we do now to go in and save them? Yeah. <laughs> you just got to serve them up a diet. Of a balanced, healthy fats, some monounsaturated fats, some poofas in the form of, say, nuts. What but, was poofas again? Polyunsaturated fatty acids. And uh, thanks, Chris. So, uh, <laughs> so you give them some of those in the form of healthy nuts, like uh, well, just just normal nuts, but just not, but don't go crazy on that. And then you also give them some saturated fat in the form of bacon, uh, coconut oil, good butter. Things like that, so that so that your you can over time as those as your body Displace processes the, the poofas. Right. Yeah, you replace them with the fats that are supposed to do those things in the cell walls, make the cells work right. And man, if you can't get behind a bacon diet, or <laughs> if you if somehow in your brain you think coconut is disgusting or something, man, you're just living some kind of faux lifestyle. <laughs> like I've been I've been rocking the uh, the. Uh, the coconut butter, man. Mm. Just a, like I get hungry oh, yeah. at work, and I just drink a, eat a spoonful of that. Yeah, it's just like it's just a, it's just a mind blowing experience. We're all if smiling. You, you want, it melts that, across yeah. your mouth and makes you smile. If you want to add another little <clears throat> wrinkle to that, try a spoonful of sunflower seeds and a spoonful of coconut oil it's, with a strip uh, of bacon. Oh well, hey, <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's the third quantum of this whole formula, Chris. It probably I, I like is. It. And, so, no, and the peanut butter doesn't count, you fuckers. Yeah. So there's, there's been much debate. Read a book. Um, I've talked to a few people, and uh, you, Rob Wolf has even like backed off of his recommendation for more fish oil and yeah. stuff like that. Um, I'm now hearing, and I, I've heard both sides of the story. Um, I've, I'm hearing one side saying like things like flaxseed oil is going to be uh, should be taking the place of your fish oil, 
But I'm being told by the fish oil guys that flaxseed oil can't be can't be used by the body like fish oil can. And so yeah. I got you know so people people coming from both sides. Um, I I still am of the there's a lot of research supporting fish oil and there's not as much supporting anything else. So I'm still on the side of the fish oil. That's what I'm still supplement with. Is this a mercury argument or what is this? So um, no, it's not a mercury ar- argument. It is a straight up oil argument. Physiology of the fat. Right. So uh, I don't know if you have any deeper understanding of like the yeah. flaxseed oil versus and and what's the difference between flaxseed oil and say a vegetable oil? It's almost like the, it, this argument is almost like. Uh, do you think Muhammad Ali was the greatest fighter or do you think Larry Zonka was the greatest football, uh, greatest fullback? It, it's not even, it's not really an apples to apples comparison. So uh, if I understand Rob and the other fish oil guys right, what they're, what they're basically pointing out is that fish oil is PUFAs and they're easily oxidizable and they probably don't, don't make a great candidate for storage. And most of the chances you have to get poof, uh, fish oil, you're going to get it in soy oil. So there's another ox, you know, easily oxidizable oil. So, do you need enough uh, fish oil to balance out your omega-6 intake to, to probably be healthy? Yeah, you do. But the best way to do that is not to ratchet up to massive quali- quantities of uh, omega omega threes by fish oil. It is ratchet down your omega-6 intake. So, right. uh, <clears throat> fewer nuts, uh, fewer uh, zero industrial seed oils, and so that's a more rational strategy if you're going for the long-term health effect. And, and keep in mind. There's no certainty in any of that. You just have to make your best guess. And then as you're doing that, look for the signs and symptoms that you might be able to identify that would tell you you're, you're, you've improved your health in some way or another. For me, for example, I cannot, I have to be super careful about my intake of fish oil because I have a, uh, a joint, you, you termed it once tuna fish knee, but essentially it's where, I did. yeah. <laughs> oh, and, wow. Hey. And essentially it's where when I get too much fish oil, I get a little wrap on my knuckle or I do a couple of pull-ups that pulls across the the knuckle of my index finger and the joint will swell enormously. And in fact, if I get it on this finger, which I have several times, it'll swell so big the ring will get trapped on my ring finger and I can't pull it off and it hurts like a mofro. So, uh, you know, this is not a a characteristic of health for me. Right. So I, I really have to be careful for that specific reason. I think it has to do more with you know, some individual genetic thing that I'm susceptible to. And I've also heard the uh, increased bruising risk and sure. bleedability, right? Well, and, and that goes with the concept of fish oil, which is that it tends to, to make your uh, bloodstream slipperier, you know, have, has an anticoagulant right. effect, mm-hmm. which could be why, it, why it's helpful uh, if you've got too, too, many, too much of an inflammatory effect. So this, this begs the question. So assuming you go, okay, look, I recognize that. I'm not going to be frying any catfish and vegetable oil. Fuck that. I'm moving towards uh, cooking with cooking. I'm cooking with coconut, or I'm cooking with a little bit of olive oil at low temperature. And right. I'm, I'm trying to. I don't Minimize always get the oxidative. Yeah, I don't effect. always yeah. get pastured meat because I can't afford it. But most of the time, I'm trying to eat grass-fed products or good quality products. So assuming that you got a good baseline hand on your diet. Yeah. Uh, for the average person, how much fish oil should be necessary? Supplement wise, because uh, one I, I, one more caveat. One more caveat. Yeah. This person, not me, doesn't really eat fish because fish is fucking gross. <laughs> yeah. Like Jim Gaffigan said, uh, I'm trying this whole vegetarian thing, uh, but I do eat beef and I do eat chicken and pork, but not fish because fish is gross. <laughs> Paraphrase. Well, you know, you're, you're, you just have to take a swag at it. There's no certainty about it, but one to three grams a day. One to three caps a day, which is going to be up to a gram of fish oil, seems to me like that's a rational preventive dose. Going to help you at least get enough that you don't have to. You're not going to be short of a, a omega threes, and as long as you're not uh, quaffing down massive, you know, mass, large quantities of omega sixes, you should get the balanced ratio of a threes to sixes. And where that comes in is there are populations that are healthy, uh, Paleolithic populations that are healthy that have extremely low intakes of omega-6s and omega-3s, which indicates that it's not so much that you need a whole big quantity of omega-3s to be healthy, it's just you need the balance. Right, you just don't want a huge imbalance in ratio. You don't yeah. want a 20 to 1 ratio like most and, people have. Right. And to be clear, like some of these guys, like like Rob was making pretty big prescriptions in that calculator about how many you should be taking. Like at one point, it was like, with a high-quality supplement, 
taking like 20 plus pills a day. 10 or 15 well, grams of fish I think, oil. I think what it was, the active which ingredients. Is a, which yeah, is a huge. lot of fish I actually oil, listened to the explanation on why they were prescribing that. And part of that was that people were eating zone and were eating a lot higher carbohydrate. Um, they were getting more inflammation. I think they were just trying so to offset it, it with more good fats. So they were perhaps uh, they were trying make to increase. Ground they were, they were, yeah, it. exactly. They're trying to increase the fat intake, and they want to increase the fat intake with good fats. That's so, where. So the lesson is moderation's <laughs> best. So as far as like, do you know why uh, flaxseed? Yeah, uh, would not short, be as effective as yeah. As fish oils oil. are, are what they call long branch chain amino or long branch chain essential fatty acids so there are 18 carbon length or some 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 such so you take flaxseed and it is a it is an omega-3 fatty acid but it's a short chain omega fatty right. acid so the it's it's probably good to keep you from say omega-3 starvation but it's not good for making the if you would if you'll take the term the the land of omega-3 milk and honey it's just it's a way of sort of scraping by it's like if you're starving well, freaking eat corn and grain, right? Right. Because <laughs> it's better than starving. Right. But it's not really nutritious. Yeah, the argument, the argument that I've seen is that we have enough. Um, our bodies will convert that flaxseed oil to the omega threes that we need, it's and no more. So that yeah. so that the the concern is that our body will do the job of converting that short chain. Um, to the long branch chain. Yeah. To, as needed. As needed, so that we don't get too much. And that may be true, and this is where this is where I really think this has been my problem with a lot of the fish oil speculation from the beginning is it's great to speculate and it's great to think about it and it's great to test it in a clinical environment and on yourself, but there's no certainty. And so, you know, until the science gets another hundred years down the road and can tell us the the things that it certainly can't tell us up to now, you're you're fishing around, you're just tinkering. Yeah. It's kind of like we were talking about programming. And I think the only thing that, that would be wrong is to pretend that you really know the right answer when you're dealing with the people that are asking you for your help. We, you know? we talked about right. this a little bit with uh, a couple weeks ago that think about like with, with this, like we talked about with breast milk and trying to replicate what is in this regular breast milk. Right. There's yeah. all these things we, we know that are in there. We try to replicate it. We do it badly. Yeah. But there's all the things you don't know are in there. So, That's right. Yeah, and the so same you thing think with about vitamin, how, vitamin D supplementation yeah. in the, versus just getting it from the sun. So if you think about how, right. yeah, yeah, if you think about how uh, how plants and animals came to be, and the long period of time it's taken you to get in your present form, you, you we can we know that there has been a long series of fights and battles that have given you the ability to fight off infection, or have given a plant the ability to fight off an invading plant. You know these these plants do incredible battle with each other, with their root structures, and they compete. Yeah. I mean, you look at if you look at a forest. Like, oh, there's a bunch of fucking stupid trees. No, These man. trees, like, the, why are trees tall? Trees fight other trees. It's yeah. slower and slower progress. <laughs> but plants are brutal with other plants. They fight and fight and fight. If you look at your front lawn, you're, you're fighting a fight every time you mow your lawn because you're basically fighting on behalf of the grass so the yeah. trees don't grow and block out the sun from the grass. But you can take advantage of everything in a, in a plant when you eat it. You, you know the great history of the plant, but you don't have to understand it. But if you try to duplicate what's in the plant with your current knowledge, you would never get close. Right. So you don't have to necessarily know to understand and trust in the the biological legacy of a pasture raised chicken egg or a right. organically grown batch of baby spinach. Yeah. You know that that's good. That's this why is, I just it doesn't try matter to get so my much food. that you understand. So I try to get my food from you know a farm where you know there's not just one single thing being grown and. Yeah, you know all the they've got a lot of different animals and it's they're amazing all now eating you each to, other's shit. You have to explain now when you say I get my food from a farm. You have to define what like a farm like at, is. like at Target. Isn't that amazing? The Target like the Farmer's Choice. You know farm, at Target, right? I, no, no, you got me. Under, you got me. Under, I mean, a far, I go to a farm for food. What do you mean? Well, I go to some place where a group of people grow animals <laughs> with feed that they raise on the farm or the grass the chickens run around yeah. and cows run around or whatever you have to say no not like injecting chained up cows with biotoxins and shit but you have to explain and define what a fucking three-year-old knows what a farmer is but people right. forget what a farmer is yeah. they get what's in what's in the three you know yeah the child the children's book yeah that version e-i-e-i-o <laughs> motherfuckers <laughs> <laughs> so, well, in the in that line, and uh, at the risk of revealing what a what a true geek I am, I love I, 
if you go back and look at the Greeks, you know, the, the overriding theme in their, in the literature of the Greeks that we know of is the idea of hubris and the, the idea of, of men attempting to do those things, which are truly the realm of the gods. So, uh, what I love about that is not that I really give a shit about the Greeks. It's just that <laughs> I, I think that the idea, if once you glom onto it, you see it everywhere. You see the hubris of trying to make baby formula. You see the hubris of programmers saying they actually know their programming is better than somebody else's. You see the hubris of anybody in the government saying they have any idea what's really going to happen when they change a law. Uh, it's just everywhere. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's part and parcel of the human experience. Only we don't think of it as hubris anymore. We think of it as... Hey, we're just that badass. <laughs> and uh, so, so we most, don't, So when somebody stands up and says, "Yeah, we're going to fix healthcare," everybody goes, "Oh, great! It's so great! Somebody's finally going to take control of that thing and make it work." Come on! It, it turns out it's kind of complicated. Yeah, right? a little bit. So, what? Well, yeah, it, it's really great that. Um, well, the cliches uh, are cliches for very good reasons. Like. People keep saying over and over again, like, money won't buy you happiness. People go, yeah, yeah, I understand. And they keep trying to <laughs> but have but I want my money, man. Happy. I want a lot of money. Yeah. yeah, but the things that are most obvious to you are most obvious to you because they're the things that you will struggle so much assimilating. Yeah. Like, yeah, it, things are complicated. If anybody steps up and go, I know exactly how everything works. Aren't I blessed? Aren't I the fortunate <laughs> one? You should come over here and hang out with me. Don't you realize how fucking complicated things are? Have you just... Taking two seconds from your pathetic life. That's why life, the, the first time take I Take two hear, seconds from your pathetic life is to go outside and look at the sky and go, wow, shit is really complicated. That's why, that's Earth's why my, really small. My, my, <laughs> my favorite politicians are the ones that, that go, I really don't know. I should probably let the free market decide. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's that's, that's yeah. why I, I like those politicians. I would just like to hear Same more, reason. More people just need to admit, they just say out loud, I don't know, and stop right there. Yeah. Because it's okay. Because there's a lot of shit that you just don't know. There you go. Yeah. It's nothing, no shame in that. Awesome. So to answer your question, we, we, we circle back and close off the, the first thing you brought up, which was the vegetable oil drinking. So that, so that you ready for another one? The only way I could close off more on the whole fish oil thing is to do your own experimenting. So if you, if you, could take, if you can eat flax seeds, which I never have and, and don't feel very tempted to, and you feel like you're getting uh, appropriate inflammatory response, you know, you fight off disease when you need to, but you're not all uh, inflamed and sore and feel like you need to take ibuprofen all the time, well, then you're probably doing all right. Yeah, I actually cover all my bases. First yeah. thing in the morning, two <laughs> tablespoons of flaxseed, coffee grinder, and a smoothie, and then fish oil the rest of the day. If you, mm-hmm. and if you I even, can't tell anything if ever, even, so if, I just take it all. If you're even participating <laughs> in this discussion, that means you're probably one of like 2% of people who are better off than the other 98% of humanity who doesn't give a shit and doesn't even think about this ever. You're right. So just they having eat, the discussion eat. is a good sign. If you're following this and participating, you're probably doing okay. <laughs> you it means Chris's... you're taking some fish oil. <laughs> so, and if you see Chris, he'll probably give you a gold star. Yeah, I'll give you two gold stars. Paul, high fives. Was, Paul was alluding to maybe the government not knowing everything and uh, controlling. Oh, shit. <laughs> Sorry, Justin. I had to hang up on you. And to, now, be, and to be fair, that goes for all members of government because a lot of them are clueless. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Most of them are. Um, so in my opinion. But, uh, so this, what was it? Taco Bell? No, it was McDonald's and their, their pink slime, the chicken nugget, pink (laughs) pink slime. I think we talked about this before. Anyways, they got, they were, they were put on the news and they were, had to come out and say, Hey, we'll never do that again. What was the news? I've seen on news before. I think it it ran viral on Facebook. Was it Facebook? It happened this time around. Facebook yeah, shook them up because that shit's. I've seen that ten times on the news. No that, one seem, cares. that seems to be a, a running problem for these. The media is they're not doing a very, not nearly as good of a job as. as uh, if you want to know what's going Facebook on, you go, like you go to Reddit or you go to Reddit or whatever uh, Buzzfeed. And you yeah, see on, what people are talking about. I just go on Twitter. You know, I follow same who I like. But uh, I guess the same pink slime that McDonald's got in a lot of shit over uh, is now headed for the public school system. <laughs> so. They're going to implement it there. And it doesn't... A million tons is what the news story says. Coming so, to a cafeteria near you. So I just showed... I just, that first thing I think of is, okay, the shit storm went down. When did that story break? Let's uh, just assume it's been at least like two months ago, right? Trying Maybe to bring three. it up right now. So it's been like at least two months since that oh, story broke. Oh, you're talking about the McDonald's like one. Like McDonald's bailed oh, yeah, that, on that like two months ago, right? Yep. So you, one has to assume there's been a pile of pink slime stuff sitting somewhere frozen. So basically, McDonald's was going about their business of pureeing whole chickens, <laughs> That's right. and then dousing it in the equivalent of bleach, and then packaging it up into little chicken-shaped morsels. Deep Is that why it tasted deep, so good? 
Deep frying it in fucking cheap vegetable oil. It tastes coated, good when you dip it in honey and coated, mustard. Right. Coated in corn syrup sauce. What the fuck? And people were eating it, eating it, eating it. And I said, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. People know what we're doing now. Big time now, bro. So we have to stop. So they make a formal announcement. We're not doing this no more. So one, other words, one battle market, is one. The market eventually worked. Yeah, one battle is one. But now there's this pile of shit in a warehouse. This cheap pink slime. Who are they going to sell it to? <laughs> so now like two months later, the government says, I know. We'll take that pureed chicken that's been sitting there for two months with bleach. And we'll feed it to kids. And this is why I tell people. Who also aren't learning shit in school, but now they're being fed shit in school. Little opposite situation there. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, so, I mean, that, 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 I mean, that goes more further into, like, the whole free market solution. Yeah. Is that it, it, people voted with their dollars with McDonald's. McDonald's goes, shit, people are about to vote with their dollars and we're going to lose a lot. And then the government. So we'll sell it to the big, government for 50 cents on the dollar. This big bumbling bureaucracy. That they vote with your dollar. They, they can. <laughs> I think you're looking at they it can wrong. Wait, they can wait years to make any change because you know CTP people point, people right? get voted out slowly and all that kind of stuff. Well, so how, mu- how much is CTP on, on, on. make how, his point? How much is how much is chicken nuggets? I oh, mean, like you know, ninety nine cents maybe. No, well, like a, like a six pack. ten pit, like a ten pit. I'm not like talking about like like you. You would know. I don't know. Probably like three ninety nine. Three ninety nine. I hear you, brother. So now you're telling me I can get the same. Let's not make a mistake. They're fucking delicious. Flat What's, out awesome. I agree. If you eat them without the, Born the and honey and mustard, things. it is not no, delicious. Still, no, Come don't, on. Don't close yourself. your mouth. Close your mouth. But the thing <laughs> is, it's three ninety nine, and we'll, we'll take that. So now you're telling me I can get those same chicken nuggets for like a dollar twenty five with the chocolate milk? <laughs> get out of town. You might have. Uh, to, <laughs> you might have to shave the beard, though, Chris. I don't oh, know if they're well, going to yeah, let the you. Market in. has you call this spoken. Like a, <laughs> Well, no, nobody is starving, but everyone next, is malnourished. Next story. <laughs> All right. Now, I actually want to read the story a little bit. Uh, McDonald's and Taco Bell have banned it, but now the United States Department of Agriculture is buying 7 million pounds of beef containing ammonia hydroxide treated beef, ground. not chicken. Yeah, ground okay. connective tissue and meat scraps and serving <laughs> it up to America's school kids. Yummy. If you thought cafeteria food was gross before. I didn't. The term pink slime was, pink slime was coined by microbiologist. Gerald Zernstein, <laughs> formerly like of the USDA. He first like? saw it being mixed into a burger meat when he was touring a Beef Products Inc. facility in 2002. Salmonella, whatever. Yeah. So it, that's Here's the a, official name is Pink Slime. Here's an interesting side thought to that, which is that we're probably made to eat a reasonable amount of connective tissue. So in that way, it might actually be more balanced nutrition than just, <laughs> than just yeah, eating I mean, the meat. You know? I personally think people should be eating more organs. That too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I know I try to so that, suck the marrow out of the bones every chance I get. So they puree most the, people don't do that. And they they think puree I'm the weird. whole chicken intestines and all. Does that count? <laughs> sure, man. Just drop it in the blender, I guess. So, That's right. Yeah. I, I'm a little worried about the the product they use to make it all stick together. That's that's what I'm more I concerned about. I think it's corn starches. And stuff. Yeah, I don't probably. mind eating chicken beak, but I don't want yeah. No, the, the I'd, no. If you, if you, I don't know if I could find the story right now, but there's a. I read a story a while back about like the actual product they use to make uh, meat stick together. Like yeah. if you go to Kroger and you buy a steak, it was probably glued to. It's like meat yeah. glue. Is well, what yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's like uh, wood laminate. But it was a meat. big deal in uh, Australia, but supposedly it's used worldwide. Nice. So, Chris, I know you had a you had a, like a little topic you wanted to bring up. Did I? Yeah, it's about <laughs> people getting too strong. Oh. <laughs> It's well, an epidemic in America today. <laughs> you know, I've, I've heard recently that uh, one gentleman's problem and his blessing was that he, he gets strong too quick. <laughs> You've experienced this, right? <laughs> Big problem. I hated it the last time I got strong too quick. It was terrible. I will, I will comment on this. Uh, I, didn't, I, didn't, I won't mention his name. He was an f- acquaintance for a while. We trained together. Uh, he got too strong too quick, but he was a, he was a former collegiate athlete who started powerlifting. Uh, he was like a defensive end or something, so naturally gifted an explosive. So he he did what a lot of powerlifters do because they want to get to the level quickly of being able to lift very large amounts of weight, and they want to settle for anything less than national level competitions, and they don't want to settle for anything less than getting there within a year or so. So he went on a very Robust regimen of chemical agents to help him get strong. Steroids. <clears throat> he was doing steroids, okay? But this fucking guy went from like squatting maybe 650 or so to squatting 900 in a year. Mm. Uh, and he, I think he was benching in a competitive setting like 725. 
and he went from pulling six sixty or so to maybe pulling eight hundred, and then he did he expl- pull all the tendons off the bone he in one exploded onto the scene, and then just as quick as he was on, he was off because he think he hurt a disc in his neck. Blew out a couple dicks in his spine. A disc in his spine. Blew out a couple, <laughs> like, dicks, a couple in, dicks. Blew out a couple discs in his spine. And I think also I tore a large chunk of muscle off his spine. Yeah. Jeez. And then was on the shelf. I didn't see him again until the Arnold Classic about a year and a half later. And at that point, it was quite clear and apparent to me he was off whatever he was doing. Because he turned into a guy who looked like he was five, six, seven years removed from college football and now a little pudgy and out of shape, but still probably plenty strong. But he just had left it. And then two years later, I see him again uh, at a competition. Now he's back competing. And now he looks like uh, Bruce Banner in a rage. He had completely changed that two years back to what he was before to pursuing the same Back on steroids. Course. Yeah. I mean, he, he, again, completely changed changed physio- physiologically. So it's like, the moral of the story <clears throat> is to, to juice, right? Well, he, he that's got, what I heard. So here's the point: if you if you if you take shortcuts to get strength, you may be able to do it, but you will surely pay the price. Oh, yeah, I but if about you're that. a normal person training hard and reasonably in a gym like ours, uh, and you're not doing that, I don't think you have the problem of getting strong too quickly. <laughs> in other words, when people say powerlifting is dangerous, there are variables in making that assessment. Yeah. So for me, I'm I'm 31. Yes, it's true. I know I look 22. I was thinking 21. <laughs> uh, I have a young son who soaks up more and more time daily. It's a, he's a joy and a pleasure, but five months old, start to get a little rowdy. Wife, I have a demanding corporate job. Uh, I do some writing on the side, so I stay pretty busy. But I train three days a week. I do it two max just about all the time. Uh, I train hard and heavy. I try to make myself better every time I go to the gym. Uh, so I train to maximum weights every week for as long as I can remember with this occasional break and I've never torn a muscle piloting never mm. had a real injury piloting my injuries came training under the guidance of a poor strength conditioning coach in football yeah right. I've never injured myself training reasonably with limit heavy weights so yeah it's, I, it's, it's when you introduce stupid things it becomes dangerous I, I think I think the the person Chris might be alluding to is somebody who's not strong Probably has never been very strong. Yeah, so but therefore, but it seems that they put not, on muscle. This is not a problem. This is this, <laughs> this is something just, I see all the time. People this being is like, a delusion. This is like the woman who thinks I don't want to touch a weight and gain twenty pounds of muscle. Exactly. I hate, I don't know how to communicate that this is impossible. Yeah, yeah, this but, is but not possible. Not only do you have people who who are fear fearful of like I don't want to touch weights and then I'll get that twenty muscles, but then you'll, or twenty muscles, twenty <laughs> that 20, twenty pounds. Of muscles. Anyway, I get new muscles. But you'll have people. You'll have people who work out for two weeks and like. Dang, my it's like, man, I've been working out for like a year, and I, I can hardly tell a difference. And you're telling me in two weeks you can already see your freaking. But that's the thing. I mean, people think that I'm gonna touch weights get huge. The people who touch weights and get huge are doing things you can't well, do and aren't willing. Well, I, to do. I, I think I think the real the truth on this one is a lot of people that come in and do CrossFit. I get it usually comes from women, but recently it's come from a guy. It's like, um, you know, I don't like to lift weights too much because I'll get too strong, too strong, too fast. <laughs> And that's a problem. I'm like, I'm like bullshit, dude. You're out of shape. I wrote, and I, you've got some kind of delusion going on in your mind. I wrote a, I wrote and a, I the got, person who says that is always the person who's out of shape. I've never met anyone who's like amazing shape. He's like, yeah, man, it just well, I started too fast. I, I, Shit I, sucks. I started a post today about strength development on the blog, and I, one of the lines I wrote was that being strong is like Harley's and and pinup girls and authentic tequila and John Coltrane music. More is always fucking better. <laughs> That's bottom line. Awesome. Like, you can argue. You, know, you can't argue it. Being strong and stronger is fucking righteously awesome all the time. Yep. And with that, we're going to wrap things up. <laughs> all right. I think that was perfect. Yep. So, Paul, uh, do you have anything? Well, we'll go with Chris first so you can think about it because I know you've got a lot. All right. Thank you. All right CTP, you got anything you want to plug? Yeah, we uh, just kicked off our Kickstarter pam pam. Uh, fuck it. No, I don't have anything to plug. Uh, no, check us out on Kickstarter. We're trying to get an Olympic weightlifting documentary made, and um, you can go to what is it? Kickstarter dot com, and then just search. If, if you just go to fitter TV, you'll be able to find the weightlifting documentary. Boom. And once you go there, it'll be obvious where you should click to donate money. F i t r dot TV. That's right. Spelled cleverly. Maybe we need a jingle. If- F-I-T-R dot TV. Fitter dot TV. TV. 
<laughs> no. So, so uh, just so you know, even if we exceed our goal, which is thirty-six thousand uh, dollars, you can still donate more, and it will be very useful to us. So just if, <laughs> <laughs> if give we, us your money. Oh yes, give us your money. But seriously, no matter if you're what. rich, please give us some of that money. Come on, man. <laughs> Smashing's cool. Give us some more money. All right, Chris, what do you got? Uh, Chris Moore. Yeah, just go to the chrismoreblog.com. Send me Rambo about shit. Paul? I'll be appearing at a CrossFit gym near you. And the next one is uh, CrossFit Wolf River, or probably Wolf River CrossFit is actually how you say mm-hmm. it. On March the 25th, where I'll give my That Stuff Will Kill You brief, and uh, and please come out and see me. And what is that? It is a template of the Paleolithic model of nutrition and how you can use that. So it's that. a nutrition talk? It cool. is a nutrition gotcha. talk. Yeah, good, good, good. Yeah. 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 Boom. I, I've and, seen and the, and the second part I'd, I'd pitch is uh, the uh, that June 9th CrossFit on a national scale is partnering with St. Jude's for, for a, the first fight gone bad for St. Jude's, yeah. oh. which promises to be an incredibly powerful partnership for a cause that probably anybody could get excited about. And so for me, it's really exciting to see that coming and happening this close to uh, something that, that's near and dear to us here in Memphis. Yeah. Awesome. Show. Yeah, and I've seen uh, Paul's nutrition talk a couple gonna times, do it? and it changes every time, but it's it's excellent. So thanks, Mike. Are they going to do anything here at the St. Jude? Uh, anything locally because it is with them now? Or I, I don't know any details about that, but like for example, you probably got the email from HQ mm-hmm. recently saying, "Hey, let's let's have a chat and see if we can do something really special in Tennessee because or and in Memphis because it's close to St. Jude." So. I you know it'd be kind of nice to see uh, maybe team up the, the I, local gyms. To I think I deleted big. that email. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> <kidding>. <laughs> All right, so so Blunt said, what would you like to? Uh, yeah, besides plug. besides the Kickstarter uh, plug TechniqueWad of course. So Doug's not okay, here, yeah. so I'm gonna then, I'm gonna stuff. plug that for him. <laughs> but then also, uh, not that I don't have any part of that, but as uh, always, check out FactionSC.com. Check out TechniqueWad, of course, and check out Threaded TV and iTunes. We are now on iTunes for this podcast. All right, guys. So now us and you two have something in common. Wrap your head around that. See you next time. (laughs) I'm lost. That was good. Oh, heck, that was worth it just to hear Chris sing the FITR song, man. Hey, it was a team effort. (laughs) Fast (laughs) up. Get jingles. I got to pee.